Welcome back for another episode of the podcast. I'm super excited today to dig into the top five questions that you need to know the answers to for a porn brain rewire. And here's the five questions. Can my brain heal from porn and how do I know if it has? Number two is, is it okay to masturbate porn free? Number three is, will fetishes or scary porn use go away during my porn brain rewire? Number four is, my partner doesn't want to have sex, now what? Or, no partner, now what? We'll cover both of those. And lastly, what steps are absolutely necessary to be able to be successful in a porn reboot? We are going to dig into those Five questions very quickly, and today's episode on the podcast was inspired by a very long YouTube live that I did yesterday with three other porn addiction recovery coaches. It was sponsored by Bill Ranshaw. We were joined by Powerful Eric and by Noah B. Church, and the four of us um, kind of did a roundtable for three hours, and that video will be live on my YouTube channel soon so you can check it out it is in fact three hours long so i wanted to do a recap of the most um popular questions and kind of break down the answers for you here and then i'm going to chunk that up and there'll be chunks of that video also but uh let's dig into these five main questions so first of all is number one can my brain heal from porn and how do i know that it has so from my standpoint 100 percent, your brain can heal from pornography use. And especially if you're out there and you're struggling and you're suffering and you think that not only will you never get out of this porn loop, that you won't ever feel good or great again, I'm here to tell you, yes, you can. The beauty and the power and the wonder of neuroplasticity says that no matter your age, no matter how long you've been using, no matter how deep you are in it, there is a way out of the quicksand. And that's going to be the last question that we talk about in today's podcast, what you absolutely need to do to be able to get out of that loop. But I'm here to tell you, yes, it can be done. And for me, using neuroscience tools, I'm able to visually see your brain performance pattern improving over time. That's what we do when I offer Muse coaching. I teach you how to interpret your own Muse graphs so you can understand how you can see your own brain healing, but ebbing and flowing in the short run. So we know in those first 90 days that there can be a lot of unwiring of the porn brain pattern and rewiring of the healthy brain pattern, and that can create ups and downs and back and forth. So you can see that in your brain performance pattern, but then you see it level off and continue to improve its functioning and to heal. So we can actually see it with data. That's the beauty of my programs is that you can see your brain healing in EEG, electroencephalogram data. It's an amazing thing. And then when people work with me in Premier Neurofeedback, I have lots of charts and graphs and I can see even more data of your brain performance pattern, many, many parameters of um, what your brain is doing and what we want it to do and how we can get it from where it is to where we want it to and where it is at any given time in that journey. So when I work with people, it's all measurable and I can see that and you feel it. So what we do is we measure your brain and what it's doing and then we map it onto your behaviors. And I know you might not know how much better you can feel, um, but just today I was talking to someone and they're like, I never knew I could feel this good after a workout. It actually was uh, Coach Zach Carter. I talked to him earlier and he's like, man, now that I've done this program of yours and I'm on my way and I'm coaching other people, these workouts are amazing. My brain feels like it is just cranking in flow state. I'm like, amen, brother. I hear you on that. So and so many other people tell me, like, I did not know my life could be like this. If you don't know what your life can be like, it can be amazing. Neuroplasticity is your best friend or your worst enemy. Worst enemy if you're watching porn because it's dragging you down into a downward spiral. It's your best friend when you decide to quit and you put the proper strategies in place. So you will know that your brain is healing because you'll see it in your muse graphs and you'll feel it in your brain and your mind and your body 
and it will show up as the outcomes and the results in your life. Okay, so we're moving on to number two. Is it okay to masturbate porn free? Um, my answer on that one was different some, than some of the other coaches, but we basically agreed. But in the short run, no. The answer is no. I know you want to hear yes in the short run, but the reality is that if you've watched pornography and you've masturbated to it, which is what most people do, that masturbation is linked to porn consumption. So it's part of that heightened arousal template and that dopamine deluge or flood in your brain. It's part of the problem. So you've heard me say before that when you know where the problem is, you know where the solution is. So if masturbation is part of the problem, it's not part of the solution. Leaving it behind, especially for the first 90 days and probably after, is really important. And I'm going to give you the caveat on that that will save you in terms of a quote unquote healthy masturbation habit. But in the short run, you really need to table it and make it so that you're not engaging in masturbation so that hypersexuality brain pattern can die off. It can unwire. We're talking about creating new neural pathways here. So if you're using the old neural pathways, the new ones cannot fire themselves up. So when you decide to leave porn behind and you stop masturbating, what you're doing is you're breaking the cycle of compulsive sexual behavior disorder. That's what it's called in the international classification of diseases, which is put out by the World Health Organization. So it's compulsive sexuality. It's going to sex to feel better, to regulate your mood, usually to decrease stress, sometimes to offset boredom. But we know from the science, it's mostly a stress decreaser. So now if you don't give in to masturbation as a stress reliever, then you are unwiring that old porn and masturbation brain pattern. It's really, really powerful when you don't give in to those urges. So here's the caveat. If you uh, try, and you know what I say about Yoda, do or do, there is only do or do not. There is no try. But if you try to establish a healthy masturbation habit, it must be scheduled. You must stay out of fantasy and stay with the sensations in your body and you're not using it as a stress reliever. You're using it as a sexual experience that you're staying in your own mind and body. And it's like a meditation. And so I have helped some people establish a masturbation meditation habit where it's really staying in your body. And it's a healthy way to continue sexuality by yourself. But remember, sexuality is supposed to be relational. It's supposed to be between two people. That's how it's designed by evolution. So if you continue a self-sex habit, it's kind of going against the natural order, the natural grain, and especially if you do it with a compulsive or frequent nature, and especially if you're giving into urges, that's part of a compulsion so that your brain can feel better. That's what we're trying to undo here. So the short answer is no. Try to uh, alleviate it, or if you have to, schedule it in. And in the long run, once your brain is unwired and it's rewired to the healthy state and that healthy state has hardwired itself in, then, especially as we get to the question about if your partner doesn't want to have sex as often as you do, or if you don't have a partner, then maintaining a healthy masturbation meditation habit, if you can pull it off, and that's a big if, that can be part of your sexuality, especially as you're improving your healthy sexuality. And we'll, we'll dig into that in just a minute. But let us go on to will fetishes or scary porn use go away? Now, when we talk about a fetish, a fetish is something that has gotten increased arousal mapped onto it into your arousal template. So it's something that really does it for you. It really gets the juices flowing and cranking. So and it can be anything. And but what we know from many working with many people is that those fetishes tend to be things that have high intensity for a lot of people. So uh, and, you know, porn sites are deliberately designed to bait you into higher intensity so that it's escalation of your behavior. And so that you keep coming back for more because, you know, they're acutely aware how the brain mechanisms work behind this. It pops up, you click it, you get even higher levels of dopamine and your brain's being linked 
to these new. Um, sometimes it crosses your moral congruency. It's things you never thought you would look at, never mind enjoy looking at. So what it's doing is it's really cranking the dopamine into your system. At the same time, it's also giving you a shot of cortisol. So it is, I call it a friction point where you're anxious and excited. So now you're being aroused by something that you kind of know you shouldn't be looking at, but it's exciting because you know you shouldn't be. And it's also arousing. So it can be dangerous in that way, in that it will lead to escalation. And what it's doing is it's really imprinting itself on your brain by desensitizing the reward center in your brain so that you need more and more of it at heightened levels. And we know that's part of toleration and escalation when it comes to um, pornography use. So that being said, there's two reasons that fetishes get started and are perpetuated. Most times fetishes will have breadcrumbs that lead you back to something that your nervous system is looking for in terms of intimacy. So it's this really kind of backwards way of getting the intimacy that you desired when you were younger, because most fetishes do trace back to when you were younger and you found your porn habit. And so, for example, in the discussion from the YouTube live yesterday, Bill Ranshaw was saying that he has a client who watches, uh, incest porn with brothers and sisters. And he realized that his father was abusive and his sister was the safe haven for him when he was younger. So it's no wonder that that's the type of porn that he's watching. Uh, many clients of mine will watch porn that has to do with older women or has a mother, uh, you know, Oedipus complex to it because they wanted that love and affection from their mother. And now they seek it out in the opposite way in porn use. So if you have a fetish, try to follow the breadcrumbs back to trauma, dysfunction, or a need of your nervous system that's being served by it, because many times that's the case. Then once you know what the need is, you can serve it in a healthy way. So for example, I work with people who will watch same sex Porn, and they realize they have issues surrounding intimacy or love from their father. And in a, again, in a backwards way, that need is being served by what they watched. And in that case, my advice is find a father figure in the real world who can serve as a mentor to you and get what you need in a healthy way from the world. When it comes to the brother, sister incest, Reach out to your sister and connect with your actual sister and get the intimacy that you need from your sister so that then as you break your porn habit, the need, the underlying need is being served because the fetish has to do with the underlying need. The fetish isn't the problem. It's the symptom. The underlying need and getting it served in a healthy way is what we really want to deal with. Okay. Number two is perpetuation. And that is the more you watch whatever you're watching, you are ingraining it. You're burning those neural pathways into your brain. The more you consume, the more those pathways are being traversed and they are being, it's just like a pathway in the real world. If it has weeds on it and you start taking that pathway every single day, five times before you know it, that pathway is ingrained and it's easy to traverse. And so in that way, the more you go back to something, the more it becomes your arousal template. So obviously not watching those genres, those acts and staying away from it is going to weed over those neural pathways. Again, making it easier to get the need met in the real world that's underlying it. But will it go away? Yes. If you stop watching it and you figure out what the need is and you get the need served in a healthy way, it will die way down and possibly go away. But I have another, um, another suggestion, coaching suggestion for you is that if that fetish is healthy, remotely, emotionally, physically, sexually healthy for you, it can be integrated into your healthy sex life. So if it's an act that you've seen and it's something that your partner would be into and you can enjoy it together and it does bring you this high level of arousal. It does bring you a lot of dopamine. If you integrate it into your healthy sex life, then you can have a very arousing healthy sex life, which obviously is um, something that we want you to have because in a porn brain rewire, we are recalibrating your brain 
to enjoy lower levels of healthy dopamine, the pleasure-seeking neurochemical. Right now, your brain's getting flooded by it through porn and masturbation, and it needs that high level, which leads to erectile dysfunction because now you can't perform with your partner who it just is human, so exists on lower levels. But if you can integrate those aspects that are very arousing to you in a healthy way, then you can have the best sex life that you're looking for. So if it can be integrated, great. And if it can't be integrated, then staying away from it is the best thing. One example there is a foot fetish. A lot of people have feet fetishes um, for any particular reason, and usually you can trace it back. But integrating into your healthy sex life with your partner, not making it the only thing that you do, not making it the go-to all the time, but it's one aspect of a well-rounded sex life that can really be very good for you and your partner in the long run because everybody's having fun. Okay, so next is my partner doesn't want to have sex. Now what? No partner. Now what? So let's talk about first, if you have a partner, and I hear this from so many people, and it breaks my heart and frustrates me simultaneously, I guess. They'll say to me, you know, I haven't had sex with my wife in 20 years and we have separate bedrooms. I'm like, why? Why would you want to be with someone that you haven't had sex with in 20 years and you sleep apart? And I get you can have a really lovely, you know, camaraderie relationship, but in a marriage especially, we're sexual beings that want to have a sex life across our lifetimes. Your wife, if she was healthy emotionally, she would want to be with you. So the issue isn't necessarily sexuality, even though sexuality is wrapped up in it. It is emotional health. So let me break that down is that if you've been watching porn and your sex life is broken down and your emotional intimate connection through physical intimacy or sex has broken down, the whole thing's become distorted for both of you which means you might not want to be with her and she might not want to be with you. So now you decide to leave porn behind. You're leaving masturbation behind. And it doesn't even matter if you're telling her that you're leaving those things behind. It's time to communicate to her that you want to be with her and that having a sexless marriage is not something you want. And if it's been going on for 20 years, this conversation's 20 years too late, but better late than never. Am I right? So... Start talking about it. Start getting communication going. Healthy communication can save your sex life. So you start talking about what you want and ask your partner what she wants. And if she doesn't want to be with you, find out why she doesn't want to be with you and solve those problems because life is way too short to endure a life of having a secret sex life on the side because you're not willing to have communication and interact with your partner who's supposed to be your partner in crime, you're not, you don't have the courage to step up and say, this is what I need from our marriage. This is part of the deal. This was, you know, my intent when we got together was that we were going to have a sexual relationship for the rest of our lives. And that's dried up. We need to talk about this. And so many people I work with, they'll go to sex therapists. They'll also talk about sex addiction, because if you're addicted to sexuality, then a sex therapist needs to know that or you could get feasibly terrible advice if you leave that out. And I've seen that happen. So, But you can start thinking about your sex life and getting it going in the right direction. Life's too short. And you know how I feel about this. I want you to have an amazing life. So write down, get your journal out. Here's a good brain hack for you here today is what do you want out of your life and out of your partnership if you have a partner? What is it that you want? Write it down. What would make the best partnership for you? I know for me, my husband and I have a ton of fun together. We laugh. We like to party. We like to watch movies. We literally crack each other up with just dumb stuff all day long. I want him to be my best friend. He wants me to be his best friend. We tell each other, you know, not everything because nobody tells anybody. Or you, Actually, I don't think it's healthy to tell somebody absolutely every thought you have, but the important things we share, we share the scary things, we share our feelings. <clears throat> We're always working on it, trying to get better because it's not like either of us default to that mode um, very easily. Um, when we are snarky with each other, we apologize. We're always trying to get back to the best versions of ourselves. We're always trying to be there as the best version of ourselves for each other. Uh, we have six beautiful children and 
how do you think we got them? And we try to continue having a great physical intimacy life together, which is not always easy with a million kids around, but we try to make time for that. Again, I know we, we do make time. It could be better for sure, but uh, we connect in that way, which is really important to keep us connected. And we talk about it. If we have any problems, we're trying to be good communicators. So for me, I want a partner who I can have fun with, who I can talk to about my problems, who talks to me about their problems, who it's me and him against the world type of thing. Uh, He knows I've got his back no matter what happens. He's got mine. And we have a ton of fun in all the intimacies. I, I just found a note in a book that I read, which was really cute, that that it's from years ago that saying that he's enjoying, you know, figuring out all the intimacies with me, which is really cute. He'd kill me if he heard me share this. But, you know, he writes me a note like that. He would never write anybody else a note like that. Like his team at work would die if they saw this little note from him. But, you know, physical intimacy is only one of the intimacies, emotional intimacy, experiential intimacy. So we'll go do things and have fun together. It's important to have a well-rounded relationship. Figure it out for yourself. What do you want? And create that and don't settle for less than that. Okay, I've de- I've gone off track too long on that one, but it really is a soapbox because I talk to so many people who are like, yeah, my wife doesn't want to have sex with me. Well, that's not okay. So start talking about it. Okay, no partner, no problem. If you have no partner in this journey, here's what I encourage you to do. Don't make the proclamation that you're going to be sober for the next year while you figure this porn thing out. But also don't make the proclamation that you're going to start dating right away. This is a journey. 90 days is the starting point to really unwire and rewire your brain. So you need that time for yourself. And so many people have a partner. A 90 day sex washout can be a good thing if your sex life isn't that great in the first place. And if you're very hypersexual, but then the whole goal of this journey is to create healthy sexuality. And we can talk about the word addiction in a different podcast, but the opposite of addiction is healthy sexuality when we're talking about pornography and masturbation we're not it's not addiction in sobriety it's addiction in healthy sexuality that is what we're trying to develop so if you don't have a partner here's your action step start building intimacy not physical intimacy but all the other ones with people in the world start seeing people as whole people join something that would be fun for you with like-minded people you like chess join chess club. You like baseball, go to baseball camp. You like to paddleboard, go stand up paddleboarding with a group. Go find some like-minded people and settle in and start connecting with them. It is amazing what it will do for you, your brain, and for other people. It's a really, really cool action step when you implement it. Um, Most people who work with me, that's a, that's a, fundamental that they have to do is connect with people in the real world. And it works so well. Um, Okay, let's move on to the last one. So we can wrap up. The last one is what steps are absolutely necessary to quit porn? Okay, steps that are absolutely necessary. Unwire the brain pattern by using a defensive mode. The number one strategy for defense is going to be the three second pivot plan. I will tell you that in just a second. Three second pivot. Absolutely necessary if you're going to get the right defense going. You need a defensive plan to unwire the porn brain pattern that is pushing you back into the screen as it pulls you in. Secondly is rewire. You have to rewire your brain for healthy mood regulation, stress reduction, offset boredom, and start teaching your brain that dopamine is in the world. Dopamine pleasures in the world, not in the screen, serotonin, happiness is in the world, oxytocin, connection is in the world. Right now, you've taught your brain that pleasure's in the screen and you need to go back more and more and more to for its insatiable dopamine at high levels. You've taught it that serotonin doesn't totally matter and oxytocin has linked your brain to the screen and to yourself sexually. We need to unlink that. Unwire, rewire your brain into the real world for mood regulation, pleasure, happiness, connection, and healthy sexuality, which we've already talked about. 
That is absolutely necessary. Number three is hardwire. You have to hardwire in that new healthy brain pattern through brain training, rewiring your behaviors, and setting goals into the future so that you know what kind of life you're trying to create for yourself. You're not just flip-flopping all along the ocean in your own life. You're goal-directed. You've set the GPS. You know where you're going. You anchor into those goals and what you're trying to create. And in this podcast, we've already done that in terms of your relationship. What do you want your relationship to look like? If it doesn't look like that, then you need to take the action steps to create the relationship that you want. And it can be terrifying and scary, but you need courage. You can only use courage in the face of fear. So unwire, rewire, and hardwire, hardwire is absolutely necessary. It's a defensive mechanism up front, three second pivot. Then it's an offensive mechanism of putting all these strategies and tools and techniques that I teach you into place to create the life that you love. When you're on purpose and you are rocking out your best life each day, you don't need porn to escape into to offset the life that you've accidentally gotten roped into, that you've accidentally created for yourself. Okay, what's the three second pivot plan? Is we know from the science you've got three seconds to run, not walk away from porn when the urge strikes. So make the plan right now what you're gonna do instead. In the day, make a plan to go do something in the world that gives you lots of dopamine. In the night, a music playlist is a really good choice so that you can put some music on. Music's dopamine producing and it lulls you back to sleep. Okay, unwire, rewire, hardwire. That's what you need to do to get your brain moving in the right direction on your porn brain rewire. Okay, I hope these five questions that we covered in the very long YouTube uh, live yesterday with my colleagues helps you out, gets you rocking and rolling to find your true authentic self and you won't need to escape into self-soothing because you will be rocking out your best life. Okay, until next time.